Welcome to In Conversation. Today we have with us in the studio David Porson, the renowned Bible teacher. David has been preaching and teaching the Word of God for something like 60 years, and he has been a blessing to tens of thousands, if not millions, of people all over the world. And in, his teachings have been introduced to a new generation of uh, viewers by the wonders of YouTube. Welcome, David. Welcome. Morning, Ian. Good morning. David is also a prodigious author. He's written over 60 books and has been published in 120 countries of the world. And many people have been blessed by his writings. But before we came on there, I was talking to David about how he came to write his books. And uh, it was an interesting story. How did you come well, to Well, I, I never had any intention or desire to write books. Publishers were pressing me to do so. And I said, no, I'm not a writer. I'm a speaker. Mm. And that was that, until I left pastoral work and began a traveling ministry and visiting many churches, I began to get burdens for them. There were things there that shouldn't be, and there were things missing that should be. And I began to share these burdens with pastors and ministers. And then I thought, what an inefficient way to share a burden. I could mm. spend the rest of my life in a jumbo jet, traveling the world, sharing burden, mm. one burden. And then I opened my Bible and there it was, Jeremiah 30. And the Lord said to Jeremiah and through him to me, write everything in a book that I have told you, says the Lord. Mm. So I said, but I'm not a writer. You'll have to help me. And I wrote my first book. And uh, it was followed by not 60, but 40 others. Did and, I say 60? Okay. And, yeah. uh, so I got known as a writer, but it meant that with one burden, I could reach mm. thousands of people. And it was a very efficient way of spreading the burden. Well, we're pleased that you listened to God and obeyed him because many of us have been blessed by books. I have here a copy of a book which I've had for many, many years, mm. and it's called uh, When Jesus Returns. Many of us have heard your teaching on the second coming of Christ. And in recent days, with the release of the new movie, Left Behind, there's been a reinterest in, a, a renewed interest in the things of the second coming. And many Christians are asking all sorts of questions about the second coming. So I thought it was an ideal opportunity to get you here and talk about uh, the second coming. And I remember when I was a, a young person and I listened to Transworld Radio and listened and, and listened to some of the great American preachers preaching the doctrine of the second coming. And I listened intently because I wanted to learn. I was a young yeah. Christian and I wanted to learn. But I tell you this, I found it so hard to understand. Really? And the first question really I want to ask you today is, why is it so hard to understand the doctrine of the second coming? Well, I'm afraid there are so many different opinions about it based on human thinking. And therefore, some pastors don't teach on it at all because they're frightened of all the different theories mm. and others latch on to one viewpoint mm. and preach that very hard. And so it confuses people. There is a lot of information about the second coming in the New Testament, so much that it's a bit of a problem to put it all together. I believe it does all fit together in one single event. Mm. But one of the ways in which people solve those problems was to, to theorize about two comings, mm. as if he's coming back twice, which seemed to resolve some of the problems, but really created more. And that's probably the biggest difference of opinion, especially in America, mm. which was highly influenced by the view that he's coming back twice. But uh, apart from that, we're living in an existential age 
which is far more basically concerned with this world than the next. Mm. And the result of that is that there's far more interest in what's going to happen before the second coming than what's going to happen afterwards, mm. which is far more important. Yes, yes. Because Jesus is coming back to do certain things, and that's where the focus should be. Okay. So let me start right at the very beginning, because some of the viewers, believe it or not, and probably haven't even heard a sermon on the second coming. Yeah. And so I want to start right at the very beginning and ask you the question, why is Jesus coming back a second time? The answer is because he hasn't finished the work he came to do. Mm. He's only done half the work that God sent him to do on his first visit. People talk about his finished work. Well, only half of it is finished, mm. and there's a lot more for him to do. The book of Acts begins with the statement, the former treatise, namely Luke's Gospel, was written to show all that Jesus began to do and to teach, mm. implying that there's a whole lot more. And certainly, by way of expectancy on the Jewish nation, he didn't come up to their hopes. Mm. And he will on the second visit. But this has created a real problem for the Jews. Why didn't he set up his kingdom on the first visit? Mm. Why didn't he take the world over? Why didn't he bring peace and justice to the whole world? Why didn't he stop wars? Why didn't he? So many questions. Mm. Well, he didn't because he had something that he had to do before that would enable those things to happen. Mm. And what he had to do first was to save individuals and get them put right. Mm. You can't put the world right until you put individuals mm. right to mm. inhabit it. Mm. And so he achieved that on his first visit by dying for them. And unfortunately, far too many Christians are stuck on that personal salvation, which was the purpose of the first visit, but he's got far more to do. Mm. He's going to present the whole world back to his father, the whole world, and a world of peace and prosperity and, and health and happiness. And he hasn't done that yet. Yeah. And many people say, well, Obviously, he can't be a full saviour because he hasn't been able to save the world. It's as in as, as big a mess as it's ever been. Mm. He's got to save the world, and he will do that on his second visit. But he had to begin to save individuals on the first, or he'd have no one in the new world when he saved it. He's going to save creation. Mm. He's going to redeem the entire planet Earth and the outer space. Mm. That's what he's come to redeem and to save. You, you're very excited about it, very animated about it. Yeah. You know, why, why do so few preachers preach about the second coming? Then? Well, because I don't think they've really grasped why he's coming. Yeah. They haven't really grasped that personal salvation is only part of the job. Do we make it more complicated than it needs to be sometimes? Probably, in our muddled thinking, yes. Yeah. But I think the real problem is that we're not teaching clearly that he's come to save the world Amen. and creation, mm. Mm. the whole thing. And he hasn't completed that, far from it. Mm. The world is still, as the Bible says, in the hands of the devil. Mm. And uh, that's got to be dealt with and will be mm. at his second coming. But most people, believe he's coming again, but have no real understanding as to what he's coming back to do. If you ask them, do you think he's coming back for five minutes or five years, or how long is he coming back for? They haven't a clue. Now, the Bible clearly says he's coming back for a long time. Right. Another fundamental question, which yes. people often ask is, is it a literal personal return? Absolutely, yes. It's more than that. It's a a bodily return. Mm, yeah. He's coming back in the same way that he left yeah. and to the same place. Yeah. And so uh, the Jesus we shall see is the Jesus they said goodbye to 2,000 years ago. Mm. 
Praise the Lord. And he will not be any older. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. Because yeah. the body he came out of the tomb with was not the body he went into the tomb yeah. with. That was a body that would grow old and die. But it, God made that old body disappear and the grave clothes simply collapsed yeah. and lay flat and gave him a new body which would never get any older. I want to get to that in a, in a, in a moment at the end right. because it's, it's, quite a, it's an exciting good news which it's, many of us who are getting older you know, find this particularly exciting. I'm going to be 33 again. Amen. Yeah. Because uh, we're promised to have a body like his resurrection yeah. body. And that was 33 and still is. Yes. And so I'm 84 now, so I can't wait to be 33 again. Yeah. Can you remember what it was like when you were 33? Yes, I can remember vividly because I thought on my 33rd birthday, I thought Jesus had finished. Yeah his first part of his work by mm. 33, and I've just started. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay. Well, going back to the movie Left Behind, yes. the whole premise of that movie is that Jesus can return at any moment. I'd like us to read some verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning of verse 1, and I'll read them to you. And then I'll ask you a question, and I'd like you to give you the opportunity okay. to respond to that question. But concerning the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. You're all sons of light and sons of the day, were not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Now, the question which I'd like to pose to you, and I, I guess many viewers would, would want to ask you this. This seems to suggest that Jesus will come back like a thief in the night. In other words, he can come back at any moment, and therefore we need to be prepared for him coming back at any moment. Is that what you believe the Bible teaches? No. Okay. <laughs> well, what do you believe? I'm going to start in a much more general way. Okay. The problem with so many of these questions and theories is that people don't know the Bible. They don't know the whole New Testament. And we've got to put together everything the New Testament says about something mm. before we jump to conclusions. Just to quote a text here and there is only possible because we've got chapter and verse numbers, mm. which God never intended. Mm. And we, for centuries, Christians had a Bible with no chapter numbers, no verse numbers. Mm. You had to know the Bible then. Mm. You had to know the context. Now, um, there are clear verses that say he will come like a thief in the night. And then immediately in the context, you'll find a statement that that is how it will happen to some, but not others. Mm to those who are alert and watching and aware of the signs of the times, it will not be like that. Mm. We shall be awake, alert. And Jesus told another story about a householder who had an idea that a thief was coming and he stayed awake mm. and watched for any sign of his coming. Mm. And when he saw the thief coming, he was ready for him. Now, it could have been soon in the night or later, but he knew it was coming and so he was on the alert for it mm. and watching for signs of his approach. Now that's what the word watch means. And time and again, Jesus said watch. He didn't say I'll be coming at any moment. And they asked him, but what will be the signs of your approach? Mm. 
how will we know it's getting near? And he gave a straight answer and gave them at least four major signs on that occasion. He said, watch for these signals and you'll know that I'm approaching, not be ready for me at any moment. Mm. So, every, so what, 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 every generation has hoped it would be mm, in their lifetime, mm, but that's different totally from this any moment he could come tonight theory. What do you see as the problem with this any moment now theory? It's a problem because it focuses people on the wrong things. It, it treats them as if panic is the motivation. Mm. Oh, he might come this minute. I must be ready. That's panic. You never find that in the New Testament. You never find that appeal. It's a strong psychological appeal, mm -hmm. but you just don't find it in the New Testament. Um, when I say it focuses on the wrong thing, it focuses on what we're doing at any minute. Mm. And the focus in the New Testament is not on what we're doing when he comes back, but on what we've been doing while he's been away for a long time. Mm. And Jesus told parable after parable, the wise and foolish virgins, the parable of the talents, in which the key character is away for a long time. Mm. And the real test of that is whether people get into mischief mm. when they think he's not coming back soon. Mm. The word is soon, not any moment. Mm. Yeah. And therefore, because the, he didn't come back quickly as they expected, they, their morals began to lapse and their behavior mm. went wrong. They just were not thinking ahead. When Jesus gets back, we shall give an account of not what we're doing because we thought he was coming back, but what we've been doing while he was away. Mm. He wants to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Okay. You kept at it while I was away. Yeah. Okay. You talked in your last answer about signs yes. pointing to the return of Jesus. What exactly are those signs so that we can look for? Well, Let's start with just one passage. In Matthew 24, they had asked him, the disciples said, what will be the signals, the signs of your coming? And he told them four clear signs and told them not to be deceived by people who started rumors. Mm. He said, trust your eyes, not your ears. Mm. And that's why there's a lot of confusion today. People are trusting their ears instead of their eyes. He said the first sign will be in the world, second sign will be in the church, third sign will be in the Middle East, and the fourth sign will be in the sky. What could be clearer than that? Okay. And then he tells you in detail what will be happening in the world first, in the church, in the Middle East, and in the sky. And of those signs, only one and a half are visible today. Which are? The first signs in the world are clearly here. Yeah. The signs in the church are coming very quickly. Mm. The signs in the Middle East haven't appeared at all, mm. and the signs in the sky not at all. Mm. And it's only with all those things, Jesus said, when you see all these things, you know that I'm just the other side of the door, mm. about to step in. Yeah. Well, now, when you've only seen one and a half of them, Mm. You don't start saying he could be here any minute. Yes. You hope it will be in your lifetime, but yes. at 84, I'm beginning to see that hope a bit thin. <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm. One of the big issues uh, with regards to the Left Behind movie is it says that the Christians are raptured out and then there is the great tribulation. The uh, word for the study of the last things, as they call it, is eschatology, mm -hmm. from eschaton, the last things. Yes. I call this picture and its theology eschapology. Oh. 
Oh, yes. I can. <laughs> it's offering people an escape from the big trouble. And it's no wonder it's become so popular, quite mm. frankly. If you fear being in such a terrible time of trouble and you're told Jesus will get you out of it before it happens, yeah. you'll grasp that as readily as anything. Mm. And I believe that's the biggest danger. I believe there will be a rapture, but after the big trouble. Mm. I believe there will come a time when God's people are gathered to meet Christ in the air. Mm. And it will mean many left behind. The trouble with the film is it puts the left behind at the wrong time. Mm. There will be a left behind when the people of Christ are gathered to meet him yeah. at his coming. I believe all that. But once you bring that rapture, as it's called, before the big trouble and imply that Christians will all escape before it happens, you're offering an escapology, mm. which is not biblical. Mm. So tell us a little bit about the big trouble as you refer to it, the Great Tribulation. I, I mean, some people say, well, you know, the church, for example, in China, is going through a Great Tribulation now. Is that what the Bible means when it talks about the Great Tribulation? No, the Great Tribulation will happen on a universal scale. Mm. It is happening locally to Christians. Uh, equally bad things are happening. Martyrdoms are taking place right now while we talk. Every 15 minutes, mm. a Christian is dying for the faith. Mm. That's terrible. As we sit comfortably here, I just feel mm. bad. Yeah. But that's not the tribulation, which will be worldwide mm. and will involve a worldwide leadership of a, an unholy trinity. Yeah. We know the holy trinity, Father, Son and Spirit, but the unholy trinity is Satan, Antichrist and the false prophet. Mm. There's a kind of correspondence there. Satan is wanting the Father's place Antichrist will try and imitate Christ and the false prophet will try and bring prophecies from an unholy spirit. So there's an unholy trinity going to be running the world. Mm. And in the last seven years, which is how long the Great Tribulation will last, they will be in charge for the first three and a half years, the first half of it, and they will bring peace and security to people, which is what they're wanting. Mm. And so there'll be a false sense of peace and security, which is the biggest deception there'll ever be. And one of the major things Jesus said at every stage of that big trouble, don't be deceived. Mm. Don't let your ears lead you astray. Just keep watching. And above all, he said, the big trouble with all its pain is actually birth pains and not death pains. Mm. That's a very important thing to say. It will be painful, but it's the pains of a new thing being born rather than the pains of death. Mm. It will feel like the pains of death. The world will seem to be dying around us. Mm. But it's actually, from God's point of view, the birth pains that will introduce a new universe, mm. a whole new age. So you believe that Christians will go through this big trouble? Absolutely. Is it possible that it could be this generation? It could be any generation. Yeah. Uh, but whatever, if I don't live to see the big trouble, I need to be prepared for suffering yeah. already. So how do we prepare ourselves for suffering? Or how does the pastors and, and church leaders prepare their congregations for suffering? I'll tell you one very simple thing. I know I've been told by a reliable source that already dossiers are being compiled about leading Christians mm. in Britain. Mm. And if there's anything that will bring them down, 
it will be brought out publicly. Yes. In other words, very simply, you prepare for suffering by living a blameless life. Yes, yes. That's how you prepare for it. And then as the Peter says in his letter, don't suffer because you've been doing wrong. Suffer for doing right. Mm. And it's that kind of suffering that Christians feel worthy to suffer. Mm. They can rejoice in it. It's, it's good. Because even though it's painful, it's pain for only a very short time and it's going to have such an eternal reward. Mm. And Christians who are suffering now will have a wonderful reward in heaven. Amen. Mm. Okay. You can even envy them. <laughs> yes, now I'm going to ask a question which really troubled me as a young Christian. Right. Uh, and, and I'm sure viewers are thinking the same question. The second coming of Jesus is a worldwide event. Or, or is it a worldwide event? I mean, yes. will, will we in Britain and those of us who are in Australia know at the same time that Jesus has returned? And how is that possible? <laughs> Strange that you should ask this in a television studio, well. <laughs> in a television age, when the slightest things that happens anywhere, yeah. we know about immediately yeah. while it's happening. Yeah. But regardless of that, there will first of all be a worldwide sign. Yeah. That fourth sign he gave them was that the sun and the stars will stop shining. Mm. Now, who's going to miss that? Yeah. And it's almost like uh, when I was a little boy, I went to a pantomime in a theater and uh, I was all excited about it. And gradually the house lights were turned off one by one until we were in total darkness. And I knew it was about to begin. And then the curtains went back yeah. and a blaze of light and crowds of people and the whole thing started. Yeah. Now that's how I envisage at the time of the second coming, the sun and stars will stop shining. No light at all, day or night, worldwide. Who won't know that happened? Mm. And then the Son of Man, the sign of his coming will be like lightning, sheet lightning from east to west. Mm. Now for the whole world to be plunged into darkness and then plunged into light, that's unmistakable. However, he's not coming back to the whole world. He's coming back to one place in it. Mm. We're going we're gonna to look at that in a moment. C can I read some scriptures? Because we have actually talked about the great trouble, the great tribulation, which is in many ways scary for Christians. Um, yes. Yeah, frightening. We've talked about preparation. But I want us to look for this final part of the interview beyond as it were, to, 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 to the joy of the, the mm -hmm. second coming, what Christians have to look forward to. And so I'd like us to read together, if, if we may, uh, two readings from Revelation chapter 21. And then I'm just going to ask you some... Not too long. We're talking about things, uh, not readings. Uh, well, I know that, but, but <laughs> I think it would be helpful for the viewers okay. to see it in context. So if we read from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 8, and then follow on from 22 to 27. Okay. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with him and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. 
And he said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderous, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in a lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then we look at verse 22, it says this, But I saw no temple in it, this is talking about the New Jerusalem, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it in, into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Verses which talk... None of that is going to happen at the Second Coming. Yeah. It's going to happen when? Very much later. Yeah. There's much better news before that happens. Too many Christians jump to the end of Revelation. Okay. There's something happens in between the big trouble, and all that. Right. And that is that Jesus is coming back to reign, not first to judge. That's yeah. a misleading yeah. idea which church creeds have embodied, which is confusing. He's coming back to rule this world, the nations of this world. He's coming back to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. Mm. That's why he's coming back to earth long before there's a new heaven and a new earth. Mm. He's going to clean up the old one. Bless you. And yeah. demonstrate what this world could have been like under a Christian government, under his government, mm. under his rule. Therefore, he has to abolish and destroy all human governments and replace them with his own. Mm. And he's going to do that in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, which is between all the big trouble in detail and this new heaven and the new earth, is a thousand years of proper rule of this world mm. and universal peace. And that's when they're going to turn their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Mm. That's a hope for this world, and that's the hope connected to Jesus' coming. He's coming back to this earth to establish the kingdom here. Mm. Now, what he did on his first visit was enable individuals to get ready to live in his kingdom. Mm. And therefore, on an individual scale, we can enter the kingdom now and live as we're going to live when everybody will have to live in the kingdom of Christ. Mm. And it is that that is the heart of his second coming. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the church does not believe that, mm. sadly. It's there in Scripture, it's clearly there, but the vast majority of Christians in my country don't believe it. Mm. And uh, that has caused confusion because they read these wonderful promises of a transformed present earth, mm. of peace and prosperity here. And cynics say, well, Jesus hasn't done much to bring that. Mm. No, he hasn't, not yet, but he will. And that's where the Christian hope lies, that one day everybody will be under his kingdom, his kingship, and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord.
Amen. And that's why he's come to this earth. He's come to get it all back for the Father and present it back to God, his Father, and say, here it is, I've, I've got it all back for you. Mm. And you can imagine his pride and joy yeah. when he achieves that. Mm. What an achievement. Wonderful. But he's only half achieved it so far. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to miss out the millennium. Uh, I, I am just... I know you didn't mean it, but... I, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I, I was told that, you know, interviewing you, you will correct me if, if I'm wrong. <laughs> I didn't mean to miss that out. What, I what, know you uh, what, I mean, The time is so short, and I want, as it were, the viewers to be thrilled by the excitement of, of, of yeah, the millennium, and, and it's going to be wonderful to reign where Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, we are going to be that government. Uh, amen. And therefore, we ought to be getting into practice well, now. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, what sort of role will Christians have in, in this millennium reign? Well, they're writing their CV now. Yeah. That's the heart of being ready for his return, that you are qualified for a job in his kingdom. Yeah. And that he's looking for reliable, faithful, good servants who know how to be good citizens of the kingdom. Yeah. That takes time, we're learning. Yes. But we're getting ready to take over the government of the world. And God help us, we can't even run the church properly now. Yeah. We need a lot of practice at getting in t we will be in his government, provided we're under his government, mm. and therefore we'll be over the nations of the world. That needs a lot of preparation. Mm. And uh, I get excited about this world being so much at peace that all the money spent on armaments can be spent feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and all the welfare money that will be available mm. when we don't need to spend it on bombs and mines and all sorts of other things. Will rockets. it be a national health service? Why not? I mean, for example, if there's no more suffering, will there be a national health Just service? Just a minute, you read no oh, more yeah, okay. suffering. Oh, yeah, okay, that's, that's a good at point. The, at the later stage. Yeah, at the later stage. And we mustn't okay. confuse Okay, okay. during things. the millennium, will there be, for example, a national health service? Will we bring healing? Will there be needs for doctors and nurses during the millennium? Yes. Yeah. Why not? What about policemen? Why not? Yeah, okay. Okay. Because Jesus will establish justice and peace. Yeah, yes. And uh, he will do it with a rod of iron. Yeah. In other words, there'll be no choice in the matter. The sad thing is that after a thousand years, of peace and health and prosperity, people will still be in a rebellious mood against Christ yeah. and will eagerly respond to the last ditch appeal of Satan yeah. to get rid of the government of Christ. Mm. And that will bring about the end of the millennium as well. Mm. Mm. Thank now, you. this is what I mean by we've got so much information Yes. That the problem is getting it together. And that involves the teachers of the church. And if teachers don't have it together, yeah. the, the church is not going to get it together. And there's an urgent need for what I've written in that book. Yes. Urgent need for clear teaching on all these things so that we can see the stages by which it happens. Most Churchgoers, idea of the future is I go to heaven when I die, mm. full stop. Mm. That's all they've been told. Mm. And far too many funeral services have implied that. Mm. Um, first, as I've said, we don't go to heaven, we're already there. Mm. Our spirits are already there, and we should be conscious of that. And secondly, we don't get a new body until some time later. And we don't get our new body until everybody else does, mm. including people like Abraham and Isaac mm. and Jacob and yeah. all the Old Testament saints. 
all together we shall get our new bodies. Mm. And we get those new bodies actually to live here. Mm. We don't get them up in heaven, we get them down here. Mm. And at the second coming, it says Jesus is going to bring with him all the saints who've gone to heaven already. Mm. Heaven will be emptied on the day Jesus gets back. They're all coming back here. Mm. And uh, they're coming back here to reign with Christ. Yeah. Forgive me, but I want to get on to Revelation. All right. Uh, to, to, I, I want. And you touched on it there. You, you talked about resurrection bodies. Yeah. And we touched on it at the beginning of the interview where we talked about, you know, you know our resurrection bodies yeah. will be completely different to our bodies now. Is there any indication? Not completely. Not completely. There'll be some similarity. Yeah. Do, do you find it significant that, for example, on the day of resurrection, that they recognized the voice of Jesus, but didn't recognize his appearance? Well, I think that was because they just didn't expect him. Yeah, you didn't expect it. Okay. He was totally unexpected. The body might have been a bit different yeah. in appearance, but I think it was that total lack of expectancy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that explains their failure. Well, there'll be viewers today who basically are in a lot of pain. They're getting old. Yes. They're losing their hearing. Their sight is going. I've got hearing. Yeah, aids, yeah, yeah. And, and they, 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 they're feeling a little bit sorry for themselves. Okay. What does this doctrine of the resurrection uh, you know, have to say an encouragement to us? Well, simply that I expect to be 33 again. Yeah, yeah. I can look forward to that. And Paul says that when you're through the pain and the suffering of old age, it will seem like a dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Bible talks about the New Jerusalem. Yes. Is that a physical place? Why not? Tell me. You mean what? I mean, what do you mean by physical? Well, I mean, mean is it a, a, a material place? Is it a yes. place we will go to? I mean, is it a concept? Some people would we say don't, we the don't New Jerusalem. Go, we don't go to it. It comes to us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about it. Well, we're now in that last stage, not the millennium. We're no. Yeah. Way into the new heaven yeah. and the new earth, when the Lord says, "Behold, I make everything new." Yeah everything, all things. And there will be a new city this time whose architect and builder is God. And Abraham, 4,000 years ago, was quite content with a tent in his old age, having left a brick-built house in Ur of the Chaldees. Mm. He lived in a tent in his old age because he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. And that city is described in as near language as we can get when we think about something so amazing and so future mm. as being 1,500 miles cubed, mm. like the Holy of Holies was cubed in Jerusalem, a holy city, 1,500 miles in each dimension and made of the most amazing pure materials. There was a, a jeweler in Manchester years ago, handled precious stones. And when he read the book of Revelation, he thought, I wonder if I could say something about that. Mm. And he knew about pure light mm. already. Cross polarized light had been invented, uh, the precursor of the laser. But a double filter of mm -hmm. polarized light made the purest light. And he shone this on all the precious stones that he handled. And he discovered that some of them become black as coal. Mm. Others become all the colors of the rainbow, most beautiful things. And whatever color they were at the beginning, under pure light, they were all the colors of the rainbow. Mm. So, for example, um, diamonds mm. have no color at all in pure light. Mm. They look like a lump of coal. Carbon. 
yeah. car, but yes. Yeah. And so there are no diamonds in the holy city. <laughs> mm. But every precious stone in the holy city he discovered turns into the colors of the rainbow in pure light. And none of the other stones do. Yeah. And he thought, how did John the Apostle know 2,000 years ago that in polarized light this is what happens? Yeah. He thought that's proof that the Bible is inspired because God knew he made those stones. In other words, even the very materials mm. of the New Jerusalem are precious to us here and very rare to us here, but plentiful there always in pure light. Mm. Um, that's just an aside. I've got slides at home of the different stones that we value here, some mm. of which are valueless mm -hmm. in the new heaven and the new earth. It's a real place made of real material. There's a real river running through it. And it's real and, people populating it. And bodies. it's real people. Yeah. But it's people who have been made fit for it. Yeah. And I think that's a very important point as we finish. Yeah. And that is that the whole purpose of being saved as an individual is to get you ready for that world. Mm. If we went as we are, we'd ruin it mm. very quickly. We'd poison, we'd pollute it, we'd do to the new world just what we've done to this world. Mm. And therefore, salvation is not an instantaneous moment. It's a process mm. of being changed into the glory of God mm. until we are fit to enter a new world without spoiling it. That's what salvation is about. I'm not saved yet. Mm. I've begun to be. I'm on the way of salvation, to use biblical language. Or as Paul said, we are nearer to our salvation than when we first believed. People have forgotten that salvation is future as well as past. Mm. I'm not saved yet, but I'm on the way and I'm going to be in one day. Now, my wife has a lot more faith than I have in many ways, and she really believes. But there's one thing I teach that she finds very hard to accept. Mm. And it's when I tell her that one day her husband will be perfect. Yes, yes. For yes. some reason, she finds it very hard <laughs> to believe. And she said to me once, if I built my faith on experience, I couldn't believe it. Yes. But I'll try and build it on the promises of God. Right. Now you're talking about your wife. I will say one, one thing that my wife says. She knows what the Bible says. And what she finds hard, it says there's no sea. Uh, and, and, you know, and she loves the sea. She just loves to sit I, and look at the sea. I was in Sydney, Australia, yeah. where there's a famous beach called Bondi oh. Beach. And I was preaching and I said, in the new world, there'll be no sun, no sea, and no sex. Yeah. Now you can find all three <laughs> on Bondi Beach. Mm. And the congregation looked as if they wanted to head off for Bondi Beach immediately. And I said, it was such a wonderful place. You'll not even miss any of those three things. Wow. Yeah, and I remember as a pastor, well, I am a pastor, but I remember when taking, talking to bereaved people, you know, they say, well, I'm looking forward to heaven so I can be with my husband or wife again. I mean, that, you know, what you've just said speaks to that point. I mean. I mean, some people would be actually discouraged to know that they, they, they won't be married, for example. I know. I think we've got to be honest here. There's a lot of false comfort given yeah. uh, about children who die, for example. And, uh, oh, yes, they're now little angels in heaven. Mm. The Bible doesn't tell us what happens to children who die, babies particularly. But I know God well enough to know that whatever he does with them mm -hmm. will be absolutely right. Yes. And I can trust him to do what's right. But yes, we ought to be honest and say, you can't look forward to family life again mm. as you've known it. That's for this world. And death ends that. Mm. In fact, uh, you should have said at your marriage, till death us do part. Mm. And that 
is the end of marriage permanently. Mm. We need to be honest and tell people. But we shall all be part of a larger family of brothers and sisters. Mm. And that's the family to look forward to. So in a sense, our relationship with God and our relationship with each other will be on a different dimension. Absolutely. That, that mm. it, you know, that marriage doesn't mean the same thing uh, as it means no. here on earth. And for one thing, in our relationship with God, we shall see Him. Yeah. That's what I wanted to get onto right now. I mean, right that's now. amazing. A absolutely. What does He look like? What a absolutely. It <laughs> says there in the verses we yes. read, he'll, he'll be there. You know. He'll be there. And, and the important thing is, right at the end of the Bible, God changes His address. Yeah. And we'll no longer say, Our Father who art in heaven, but Our Father who art on earth with us. Yes. In fact, He's moving to earth. We're not so much going to heaven. He's moving in with us, and His dwelling will be with us, yeah. and He will be our God, and we shall be His people. That's going to be an incredible relationship. It's exciting, isn't mm. it? It's exciting to think. The whole thing is the, exciting. The whole thing, and, and it, I find it sad that so many Christians don't know about know. this, and they, they live their life, as you say, existentially in this world, where, where you know, there's so much promise yeah. uh, for the world to come. It's and exciting. I find it sad that films like Left Behind are not about all this. Yeah. They're focusing on what's going to happen before he comes yeah. back. Yeah, yes. And that's the wrong focus. Yeah. The Bible focuses on what's going to happen afterwards. Yeah. We're coming to the last two or three minutes of this. Yes. Interview. I want to ask... All too short. I, I know it's all too short. I could yeah. spend all day talking to you about this subject. Uh, but I, I just want to ask you about the nation of Israel. Where do they fit in this whole uh, story? And you want me to answer that in the last two you've minutes? Got, you've got two <laughs> minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I did it in two minutes. <laughs> they fit in because made promises to them which have never been cancelled. Yeah. They are still his people. But they're not his people in the sense that Christians are yet. But there's a promise that when Jesus comes back and they see him, they will do what Paul did on the Damascus Road when they, he saw the Lord. And they will realize what a terrible mistake they've made and what a terrible loss has been theirs for 2,000 years. They could have been the leaders of the world, but they failed in that mission. But God hasn't given up on them, and He never breaks a promise. And He's promised that one day, when Jesus gets back, they will turn to Him as a nation, mm. the only nation on planet Earth that will do that mm. and turn to Him as a nation. So our future is linked with theirs. And incidentally, the new Jerusalem for which we're heading is a Jewish city with 24 Jewish names inscribed mm. on the gates and the mm. foundations. It's terribly Jewish. Mm. We have, when we came to Christ, we became part of His Israel. Mm. We came, became part of His people, and we became fellow citizens with, with the Commonwealth of Israel. So that's a whole other section of the information about His coming that must be fitted in. It's all very complicated, but I have a kind of mental box yeah. labeled wait and see. <laughs> Amen. And all these bits of information are in that box. Yeah. And one day I'll understand how they all fit together yeah. because I'll see it. Well, that's a very appropriate place to, to end. David, we want to thank you. You've brought to us some new insights into this whole area of the second coming of Jesus. Thank you for Not joining us. Not just with my head, but with my heart. Thank you for joining with us. Bless you. That's it. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you will join us again next time. Thank you, and bye-bye.